let me start maybe by talking from a space where I'm slightly more comfortable, which is the economic space. When we talk about business, and today we talk about the growth on the continent, and we talk about the fact that we need to create more jobs, and the fact that we need to improve prosperity on the continent, we have seen time and time again, and the report also highlights that, that when you have women in positions of leadership, business does better. Business is more profitable, and there is more value creation, there is more innovation, and we just do well collectively. However, I think once we talk about the gender gap and gender parity, it is important, I think, sometimes to unpack it a little bit. And the benefit of pieces of work like the one we're talking about today, the Global Health 5050 Equality Works, is that the literature is beginning to become a lot more diverse on the topic of gender equality and the gender gap. Before, we just used to talk about you know, we need a gender equality. I think today we are unpacking it. You can unpack it into economic participation, you can pack it into educational attainment, health and survival, and political empowerment. How are we doing when you start unpacking this as a people uh, in, in the global space? On economic participation, we're only 58% there. So essentially, we still have 42% of the gap on gender equality to close. On education attainment, and this is good news, we're 95% there, so we have actually, at least at the basic education level, has begun to put a lot more girls into school. On health and, and survival, and this is what this report is also linked to, we have actually made quite an amount of progress at the basic level. We're 96% there, globally. I'll come back to the African numbers. On political empowerment, and this is why it is so particularly important to have Madam President with us today, it's the space where we have done the list we are only 23% there. So we still have almost 77% more work to do to close the political empowerment gap. And we know that policy and politics is where decisions are made about women. So if you do not have women in the space of political decision making, it's very difficult for these conversations to continue to happen. And that is why it is particularly important to have the president here. The World Economic Forum has done a report that shows that for Africa, it will take 102 years to close the gender gap. Globally, it will take 217, so let's not feel too bad. But, <laughs> but thanks to the Rwandas and the Burundis and the South Africans of the world and the Namibias, they've helped us get a little bit better. From an economic point of view, when we talk about the gender gap, the fact that women are not participating in the economic empowerment piece loses $5.3 trillion for the world economy. This is jobs, this is prosperity, this is a betterment of ourselves that we are losing because we haven't been able to close 25% of the economic gap. And I think this is why the economic empowerment piece is particularly important. The piece today that we're talking about, Equality Works, Global Health 5050, is about this economic empowerment piece. It's about women in the workplace. How do women in the workplace fail? And I really like, and I must thank uh, Ms. Sarah Works and Ken Buse for this. They say that they're doing the report because they want to inform, inspire, and incite. Inform, inspire, and incite. If there's three words you take away from here today, those are the three. Informed with database analysis. Again, as I started saying, I remember a few years ago when we did the first gender report, there was so much pressure uh, uh, at the World Bank Group about whether we could actually do a report that showed that women were valuable and that there was an economic value to that activity, so much so that we had different constituencies saying you can't publish the report. And that was the first sort of global health report. Today we have reports by the World Economic Forum, McKinsey, global reports, but I think that this one report that is looking at the space of health, and there is no space where the woman's life, the woman's prosperity, the woman's future is more important than the health space. It's particularly important because it dissects what it means to have gender equality in a profession that is so important for our very survival and the survival of our communities. And so they give us data, data about how many women run at the big health clinics. You know, seven over 10, seven out of 10, 70% of the big health businesses are run by men. So the decisions for sure do not, are not decisions that necessarily impact on, uh, uh, have a gender lens uh, uh, to them. They look at, they also want the work that they're doing to inspire. Basically, they want us to say, you know, when you see this data, 
you know, people say we're committed to gender equality, but only 70% of the businesses, once you say you're committed, it's one thing, but are you doing something about it? Only 70% of the businesses say, first of all, that they are committed. Then when you see those who say that they are committed, are they actually putting in place policies? Because it's one thing to be committed, but it's another thing to have the policies in place. Very few of them are giving parental leave. And when they give parental leave, it's much, much, uh, it's two weeks as opposed to one month. How many of them have child care centers within the communities, less than 50%. I think having that kind of data, and I think if what you cannot measure, you cannot change. And having this kind of data broken down by institution, I must say that uh, the United Nations comes out looking quite good, Michelle, so we're doing well. <laughs> but clearly there is a lot more that we need to do in terms of policies. Equitable outcomes, even when we finally you see a firm that says, I'm committed, and I'm going to put in place a policy that gives you the right parental leave, that allows you uh, uh, to take care of your kids, the women don't get the same amount of pay. So we are 55% in some cases paid lower at the same levels doing the same jobs than the men. So you need to work at that as well. Then there is the equality, dignity, and respect aspect, and I think Zane talked a little bit about it in terms of harassment, in terms of how women fare in the workplace and what more we need to do. I think breaking this down, and providing that kind of competition across businesses, across governments, across civil society, across NGOs and across religious, I was actually surprised. And again, thank you, Karen and Kent, because you actually really look at the whole spectrum. We know today, particularly on the continent, that healthcare is particularly provided by CSOs and by the religious groups. So it is important that you also have religious groups in this breakdown, because we do need them to be inclusive in that process, and this report also provides that. So if there is one thing that I want to end by saying is you have provided us with clearly something that shows us that when one has commitment and policies to help women become stronger, we know what to do. Most of the time people say we don't know where to go, we don't know what policies, we don't know the impact of the policies. You have been able to dissect it in a way that allows us then to ensure that we can call to task and make sure that big business, small business, civil society and governments are accountable for the gender equality question. So again, thank you very much for that.